The first session of the day in study design and data analytics is from Julia Greenwood, uh, who's one of the team members here at Alstom. Uh, this is a Thermo sponsored talk, so we want to thank Thermo for that. Uh, Julie studied physics at University of Bristol and went to do uh, research in surgical robotics and medical imaging at Imperial College London. London. Uh, she joined Alston Medical in July 2018 as a product development lead before becoming program manager in our research products and services program in 2019. She is responsible for managing internal R&D projects as well as the service delivery teams. Julia's talk is called Enhancing Breath Biopsy Through TDGC Orbitrap Mass Spec, the Omni Assay. Over to you, Julia. Thank you. This presentation is on enhancing breath biopsy through TDGC Orbitrap Mass Spectrometry. I'm going to introduce breath biopsy in the Omni Assay and discuss metrics for understanding and enhancing our biomarker discovery performance. I'll give an overview of the Omni Assay discovery capability and also point towards examples of the Omni Assay in practice. For those of you who aren't familiar with Alstone Medical, the company mission is to save 100,000 lives. There are two big problems in healthcare. Too many people are diagnosed when it's too late to cure them, and too many patients are on drugs that don't work for them. Every time you breathe out, chemicals called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, are carried in the breath. Some of these VOCs are biomarkers for disease and everything from cancer to infectious diseases. And we're working out how we can identify and use those biomarkers for early detection and precision medicine. So here's an overview of our breath biopsy service. We send out our breath biopsy sampling hardware to the clinic. That includes our receiver breath sampler, our Casper clean air supply, and our breath biopsy kits, which include solvent tubes and a single use mask. So breath samples are taken in the clinic and then sent back to Alstone Medical, where we analyse the uh, breath samples on our Orbitrap platform and save the data in our digital biobank. We then apply biostatistics to the data to identify or validate potential biomarkers. The Omni assay is Alstone Medical's most advanced biomarker discovery offering. So after the samples arrive at the breath biopsy laboratory, they're analysed on the TDGC Orbitrap on a method that's been optimised to maximise the number of compounds detected in breath. The high dynamic range of the Orbitrap platform enables detection of high abundance VOC alongside trace level analytes. After deconvolution and feature extraction, the feature list is passed by the breath biopsy VOC library. That enables us to provide confirmed IDs for compounds that match against that library. The output is a complete feature table of scaled and normalised VOCs. So the introduction of the Orbitrap has enhanced our capability. But before I describe the performance of the Omni assay, I'm going to describe how we measure the capability. So it's all based around this hypothesis which is that we'll see a biomarker in our data if we measure changes in alveolar VOC composition, which reflect a metabolic or physiological process. So if you have a look at this diagram, we have metabolic physiological process or pharmacological response causes a change in our alveolar VOC composition. That's according to a blood to breath transfer function. Now that change in alveolar VOC composition is measured by the breath biopsy platform according to the system response. Now that system response is affected by sample capture, sample handling, sample analysis, and even data processing. So it's the system response that's really going to be the focus of the talk today, um, especially around the Omni assay. So what is system response? Um, so this is a, a sort of simple illustration um, of an increase in alveolar concentration resulting in an increase in measured output. This is an idealized example where there's a high signal to background and low process variability. Now imagine the case where we have low signal or no signal. In that case, for the most part, there'll be no system response. So an increase in alveolar concentration will not uh, result in a change in the measured output. What's more is that if we have a small signal above a large background, that signal is going to be very vulnerable to fluctuations in the background, and we'd expect to see a high relative variability. High variability looks like this. 
It means we're less likely to observe a change in alveolar concentration. In this situation, we'd have to rely on really large sample sizes to be able to observe a statistically significant change in the output. So using this theory as the basis, we can measure the performance of the omni-assay by examining the number of compounds that are measured on breath and the variability associated with those compounds. So chromatograms contain hundreds and even thousands of peaks. Um, those could be from breath, but they could also be from equipment, environmental contaminants, lab contaminants, etc. So we define a compound as on breath if it's distinguishable from the background noise. Specifically, the area under the peak must be high or equal to the mean of the chemical background plus three standard deviations. In this example here, I've included three examples of a uh, chemical background. So the first is a tube blank, which as it sounds is a blank sorbent tube. The second is the Casper blank, which is our clean air supply sampled on to the sorbent tube. And the third one is a system blank um, shown here. That's taken as per usual breath sample, except for the, the human is replaced with the glass head. So the most representative background is one that contains everything on a sample that's not come solely from a person's breath. So extensive R&D within Alstone has shown us that typically the best proxy for chemical contamination in our breath samples is actually the system blank. So that's generally the blank that we use. Now, in this example, you can see the abundance of this VOC on breath is significantly higher than it is on the background samples. That means that we have high confidence that that VOC is coming from breath, that it's true biological signal. So here are some real life examples. Um, isoprene is a, is a compound that we measure commonly across all of our breath samples. This study was done on 32 healthy volunteers within Alstone. You can see in the system blank that I, the abundance of isoprene is very low and uniform. Whereas on the breath sample, you can see for the majority of the healthy volunteers, the abundance of isoprene is higher than the uh, mean system blank plus three standard deviations, which means that for the majority of the volunteers, we consider isoprene to be on breath. Similar story for phenol and also hexane. Methylthiophene. We don't measure this uh, this VOC on our system blank, which means that for every healthy volunteer, we consider this uh, this compound to be on breath. And also, three methyl two hexone is another example. So the key thing about these on breath compounds is that we expect them to have good system response. So we carried out a small experiment, which was that we doubled the volume of breath that we took. So this is isoprene again. We know we see isoprene repeatedly on breath. And what we can see with isoprene is that we, when we doubled the volume of breath sample taken, we saw an increase in the response. Interestingly, you can see that the, uh, the abundance of isoprene hasn't doubled in the system blank. So that's a really nice example of how we would expect an on breath compound to behave. Here is 3-methylthiophene, similar story. Um, the, the compound is found repeatedly on breath and when we double the sample volume, um, we double the response. So this kind of system response is what you would require in order to see a biomarker if it's there. So for reference, this is what we'd expect um, an off-breath compound to behave like. So on the left hand side, you can see that there's not much difference between the breath sample and the system blank. And when we double the volume of the breath sample, we don't uh, we don't get a system response. So there's nothing in this data that tells us that this is a real biological signal. Therefore, when we are calculating our capability, we would not count this VOC as something that's considered to be on breath. So zooming out then, this is a snapshot of our capability since introducing the Orbitrap. Again, this is the same study with 32 healthy volunteers. We measured nearly 500 VOCs on our breath samples. The y-axis here is the placenta subjects for which the VOC was on breath. For a few VOCs, we see a repeatability of 100%, which means for every volunteer, that compound was on breath. 
For 140 of the VOCs, we see those on breath across at least 60% of subjects. So repeatability is something that's important to us. And this is why. So consider the scenario at the top here, where we only detect this VOC quite rarely across a population. In that case, it would be inaccurate to claim that the, that VOC is representative of a tested condition, and it may also be of limited use in the clinic. So instead, we optimise for this bottom scenario here, where we measure the VOC repeatedly across a population. Going back to this data here, Again, the orbit trap has increased the number of VOCs we measure and the repeatability with which we measure them on breath. But we are still um, pushing this envelope upwards and outwards to increase the number of VOCs we measure repeatedly. So, so far we've talked about signal to background. Um, the other key aspect of the omni assay performance, as I covered earlier, is variability. Now, again, variability is important because it tells us how big the effect size has to be for us to be able to see a biomarker if it's there. Now, the introduction of the orbit trap has helped us reduce the process variability associated with the omni assay. And this is a snapshot of our capability. So this is uh, an experiment just taken on one person who provided breath samples within a short period of time, five breath samples over a few hours. And we've plotted here the RSD for compounds that are found repeatedly across the sample set. Now, it's interesting when you compare that to the intersubject um, study with the 32 healthy volunteers. Now, it's difficult to distinguish process variability from biological variability. And by process variability, I mean variability introduced by chemical contamination and by the sampling hardware, etc. The key thing here is that as we continue to optimise the omni assay for low process variability, we can begin to measure true biological variability that's associated with those on breath compounds. And we believe that's what we're seeing here when we compare the intersubject study to the intrasubject study. Now, why is biological variability important? Well, again, as I said, variability itself is important because a smaller variability gives us a bigger chance of seeing a biomarker there for a given effect size. But biological variability is also important because it has implications for the study design and also for the type of clinical test that can be developed. So consider these two scenarios. On the right hand side, you can see for these five subjects, the variability of this VOC reflects the variability for the global population. That basically means that we can apply a threshold for normality across the whole population. And that can be relevant to the individual. But then consider the scenario on the left hand side. The variability in VOC abundance for each subject is very small, but the variability across the global population is, is big. So it means the threshold for normality cannot really be based on the global population. So what's abnormal for the first person is normal for the second person. So a real life example of this is heart rate. So the heart rate for an athlete, for example, could be 45 beats per minute. So a rate of 90 beats per minute would be a sign of disease. But 90 beats per minute might be perfectly normal in another person. So this kind of scenario has implications for a study design when looking for a biomarker and also for the type of test that could be developed. A test developed based on this type of biomarker would probably have to be more bespoke to the individual. So to give a summary of what we've covered today, I've introduced breath biopsy and the omni assay and given a snapshot of our new capability following the introduction of the TDGC orbit trap. I've talked about why we measure capability the way we do and why it's important. So all of the data I've shown you has been produced by the new orbit trap platform. That includes sample analysis uh, on the GC, untargeted feature extraction with compound discoverer, and also the use of the Chromelian software. If you'd like to hear more about how we're applying GC orbit trap in breath biopsy studies, there's a poster which uh, discusses a study that was performed on elite runners, and also a presentation that discusses EVOC probes and chronic liver disease. 
A huge thanks to everyone at Alstone who's helped to pull this data together. It's really been a big collaborative effort to produce all of this data and, and all of these capability metrics as well. Um, so thank you to everyone across all of these teams. And of course, also a thank you to Thermo Fisher Scientific for the continued support to help us integrate the TDGC Orbitrap into our breath biopsy platform. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. So if you could start the camera and microphone, we've got uh, a few minutes for questions as well. So I, I thought I could uh, open up with one. So yesterday in the legal presentation, so one of the points that was brought up is obviously that difference between the number of uh, features or compounds you see in the chromatogram versus what's actually on breath. I think you, you covered that very well. So it seems that there's two um, possible ways that you know improvements can be made. So one is around uh, boosting or enhancing signal, and then the second uh, part is about reducing background. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit things that can be done there uh, related to that single uh, signal to background ratio. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Billy. Um, so, so let's start with the background contamination. I mean, we get background contamination from sort of all aspects of the process, really, as you'd expect, um, from sort of handling tubes in, in the clinic, handling tubes in our lab, um, even the dry purging process, um, all of these sort of aspects add contamination, as well as the sampling hardware itself. Um, but a lot of things that we can do to reduce that um, and work there is still ongoing. So on the sampling hardware, we look at the materials really closely. Um, so we make sure that the sort of the consumables and also the reusable part of our receiver hardware um, has low outgassing of VAC. And when it comes to the tube handling processes, we have very rigorous um, sort of quality controls in the lab to make sure that um, each aspect tube handling is as clean as possible. The way we store our brass caps, our diff lock caps, um, et cetera, um, are sort of as low in contamination. And, and again, our ability to sort of measure blanks helps us to, to track progress over time. So we, we've seen that system blank go down and down and down as we've managed the contamination. Um, in terms of the, if the signal, um, there's also a few things you can do here. I mean, the most obvious one is um, the volume. So obviously increasing volume is, is going to give you um, higher signal. There's also maybe some more sort of um, inventive stuff that can be done around um, breathing maneuvers, for example. Um, and also the, the type of fraction that we take. So we didn't really talk about um, our ability to take different uh, fractions in the talk. Um, but what we are doing to sort of uh, make the signal as high as possible is we take the sort of what we call the lower long fraction, which is where we believe there's the highest amount of um, gas exchange going on in the lungs. And that helps us to really concentrate um, that uh, signal as much as possible for a given volume of capture. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so it's a question from Rianne here. Uh, isn't it possible that a compound is on breath and healthy volunteers but not in ill patients. What do you do then? I suppose you can apply it in a vice versa type scenario as well. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, so the answer to that is yes, of course, that, that might be the situation. Um, I think the honest answer is um, we, we don't know if, if there are compounds that behave in that way, um, but there, there may well be. But the, the point is that um, if we know that we can measure these compounds repeatedly on breath, we know that we'll actually be able to measure that behavior. Um, and once we can measure that behavior, that is effectively measuring um, a biomarker then, if there's a difference between healthy and unhealthy patients. Um, so, so really it's not about sort of um, whether, or not, whether or not you can measure a compound repeatedly in a healthy or, or an unhealthy population, but it's knowing if you can measure that repeatedly, um, then if there is that kind of behavior, you'll see it in your data. Thanks. Um, one question, what's the unit on the y-axis in the abundance plots for the ice cream? So I think for the box plots for the different chemicals. Um, the unit for that, I think it's area under peak. Um, I don't think that data was normalized. Um, so it's area under peak, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, question from Julio. The thermal GCR is very high resolution, slow detector. Uh, deconvolution is part of the process. How do you measure level of confidence in deconvolution? We've also got Dom on as well from Thermo. So I don't know, Dom, if you want to take that particular question. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, good presentation, Julia. Um, so with regards to the GCRB trap and the studies at Owlstone, I know they were acquiring data at 60,000 mass resolving power. Uh, and that's acquired at seven hertz, so seven spectra per second. And I think that's uh, across a three second GC peak, that's going to be giving you between 20 and 30 points across that peak. And you're right, that, that level of acquisition rate will give good level of uh, deconvolution to extract all of the peaks, peaks from the data. A way to test that would be obviously to have a blank and then add known compounds to a sample and then because you know what you added, you should be able to then uh, detect those incremental number of compounds in the, in the standard. So that's how I would do that. Um, so at 60,000 resolving power spectra acquired at seven hertz and on the orbit trap and occasionally we can go to 120,000. I know the our stone team have uh, done that. And when you move up that level, you go half on spectra per second, so we're at about four spectra per second, 120. Uh, but the important thing is for this type of study is that you maintain the sensitivity as you move up the resolving powers. Uh, so that's obviously important for, the, for this application. Brilliant, thank you. I think we've got time for just one question. So uh, it's a fast one, is the breath sampler reusable? Yes is the answer to that. Um, one from uh, Rakesh, in the case of double breath, the volume of breath is doubled or what? So I think that's a clarification of what the double breath means in, the, in that box plot. Yeah, um, so yes, it's the volume that's been doubled. Um, so the way we did that was we just doubled the sampling time rather than doubling the, um, the flow rate with which we sample. So yeah, that, per that person was, um, was sampled for double the amount of time. Brilliant. Okay, so we'll need to close it there. So the um, rest of the questions can be answered uh, with typed responses. Uh, thanks, Julia. Thanks, Dom, for that. Thank you.